Good morning. It's 9.30, so I'm going to call you to come and find a place. <laughs> and uh, as you're finding a place, let me encourage you to make sure that you have a worship bulletin. And that you'll be able to look at some important announcements and things that are inside. Um, let me let me quickly just say uh, happy anniversary to Sarah and Robert last week, this past week, through the week someplace. Happy anniversary to you guys. How many years? Fourteen. Fourteen. Praise the Lord. We thank that, thank God for that, and uh, we rejoiced with you in celebrating. And I wanted to say that because I'd like to encourage all of you. Perhaps you have an anniversary this month, and you didn't, we didn't put your name in here. I'd just like for everybody to take out one of those little seat back cards. Not everybody, every married body, and put your uh, anniversary date on there. If we haven't, if you haven't seen it in here, or if you think we don't have it, or even if you are pretty sure we do, how about just take one of those cards out of the seat back pocket and write your name and put your anniversary date on there for for us. And and we need the year as well because and also when you give us birth dates, um, the computer just demands the year. Now, we can click a little box on there that says, don't reveal the age. So for, for everybody over seven or eight or so, we just click the box, all right? Um, and that way, we're not revealing your age, but um, we, have to, we need to have that. So if you, could, if, you haven't, if you would just take one of those cards, husbands, if your wives, if your husband is not here, husbands, take one of those cards out of the seat back pocket, Put your anniversary date on it and put it in the offering plate when it's passed a little bit later this morning, please, so we can start uh, recognizing your anniversaries and praying for you. I think this is one of the primary places that the enemy would attack you is in the health and well-being of your marriage. Uh, marriage is the reflection of the love of Christ for his church, and if, if the enemy could mess up the witness of Christ in the world any place, he would love to do it in your marriage. So let's be aware of each other's marriages and our anniversaries and be praying. And let me encourage you to, to be praying much for Robert and Sarah um, in these days as they celebrate their anniversary. All right? And speaking of anniversaries, if you'll notice on page 8 of your worship bulletin, there is an announcement and an invitation to the wedding for Byron Whatley and Susan Leanna Gibson. And uh, just so that you're aware ahead of time, she has a double name like Mary Carol does. And so it's, it's don't say, don't be cool and call her Susan or Lee or something. Call her Susan Leanna and that'll just be great. And I'm not saying that because she'll like bite your head off or something. She's pretty gracious. I'm just telling you. So I'll stop there, okay? And there's a... Um, there's a shower coming in October for them, and I think that all the pertinent information is on page 9. You can uh, purchase things for them. They're registered and then be a part of that fellowship as we gather at the, the home of Bonnie and Kevin Pugh to look forward to, to Byron and Susan Leanna's wedding. Also, um, there are some cards here on the front of the pulpit reminding you that the, the Neely family, BJ and Casey, are going to be adopting next year, and they're in that process now. There are also some cards in the vertical board on the, in the hallway that you can pick up that reminds you, and it gives you a website or a blog spot, and those kinds of things, that you can be able to keep up with what's going on with them and pray for them. And one thing that you can do uh, is participate this coming Saturday in a, a yard sale as they're raising funds for that. As you know, that's a pretty expensive endeavor. And so we can participate in that. It's going to be here in the parking lot at the church. And so you could contact BJ or Casey and say, how can we help? How can we be a part of that? Can we give you $5,000? Anything like that. Okay. <laughs> All right. Those are ways that you can be participating in the family uh, this week amongst many others, I'm sure. But we've gathered to worship the Lord together. It's good to be able to, to gather on the Lord's Day to the end of the week and set some things aside and, and to be able to encourage one another as we sing and read Scripture together. And so let me encourage you to stand with me, if you would, please. And we'll look together at Psalm 117.
Would you join me as we read together this call to worship? Praise the Lord, all nations, extol Him, all peoples, for great is His steadfast love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. This is the entirety of Psalm 117. And you might read across it and think, wow, what a little short psalm. That doesn't really have much in it. But let's go back and pray through this psalm together and ask the Lord to help us to exalt Him and extol Him this morning as we're gathered. Would you join me as we pray? Father, we hear this call that you have, have made that every nation is to praise you because you are worthy of the praise of every person. Every creature on the face of the earth is made to reflect back to you glory and honor as the creator and the king of the universe. And we praise you and thank you, O oh God, that you have issued this call not just to uh, one nation, but to peoples in every tribe and every tongue and every nation. And that you have included us in the gracious call to bow before you and to worship you. And we pray that, God, we would be a people who exalt and honor you this morning as we've gathered. And we recognize, Father, that there is much for which we can praise you because great is your steadfast love toward us. There is, is no end to your infinite love because you are infinitely God. And there is no end to you, no end beginning, no end, no limit, no, uh, no, no bonds that hold you, nothing that constricts you except the perfection of your own holy will. And so as you, God, our love, your love toward us is great. Father, you are unchanging the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so your love is steadfast because it is who you are. It is not wavering, it's not conditional, it's not up and down or dependent upon our behavior, but it's dependent on your character. And oh God, we praise you for that because your love is steadfast. And we praise you, oh God, that you are faithful. We, oh God, we realize we are not a faithful people. We do not keep our word, we are not consistent, we do not worship you as you have commanded, but you, O oh God, are faithful, and your faithfulness endures forever. It's not a, uh, a momentary faithfulness. It's not a faithfulness that wears out or runs out of energy. It's not a faithfulness that comes to an end because of, of our lack of faithfulness but it is wholly dependent upon you and your character, and you are forever lasting God, steadfast in love and faithfulness. And so, Father, we thank you for this brief word that speaks so much about you and calls us to recognize your greatness and majesty and glory. And we ask you to help us now as we gather as your people to worship you as you are worthy of being worshipped. And we ask for these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Would you join me as we sing together? Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise Him, for He is your help and salvation. All ye who hear, now to his temple draw near. Praise him in glad adoration. Praise to the Lord who o'er all things so wondrously reigneth. Shelters you under his wings, yea, so gently sustain.
should I gain from 
let's pray together as we have, have professed in our singing that God is worthy of worship and praise because of his greatness and as we've also recognized the provision he has made for us through Christ's death and burial and resurrection to cleanse us from our sin would you pray together with me first asking God to apply that provision to your own heart as your new obedience so we, uh, we worship God because he is worthy of worship and we worship him because we are desperately in need of him let's pray together Father, we bow before you this morning in, in worship and praise because of who you are and also because we are a desperately needy people. We confess that we are sinners and that we are not able to bring to you any offering that will satisfy your holy demands. And so we come to you as you have commanded and bring to you our sin. We thank you that the Lord Jesus Christ has taken that sin away from us and given to us in a divine and heavenly exchange. He's given to us his righteousness and perfection. And because of that, we press on after Christ. To the praise and glory of your grace. In Jesus' name we thank you. Amen. Because this gospel promise is true, therefore... Preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that we brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. This impossible command given to us because of the provision of the gospel because of what God has done to transform us. And we sing now from the Psalms, from depths of woe, not so that we can be morbidly introspective, but to recognize that from which God has brought us and to, to, turn, to, to give him worship and praise because he's brought us out of our depths of woe and into worship and praise to Christ Jesus. Would you stand together with me as we continue to sing and, and worship him? of woe I raise to thee a voice of lamentation Lord turn a gracious ear to me and hear my supplication and thou iniquities dost bar our sins and wounds and misdeeds bar oh who shall stand before thee oh who shall Wash away the crimson stain, grace, grace alone availeth. Our works, alas, are all in vain, in much the best life faileth. No man can glory in thy sight, all must alike confess thy might, and live alone in mercy. alone by mercy. Therefore my trust is in the Lord and not in my own merit. On him my soul shall rest his word, upholds my fainting spirit. His promised mercy is my Lord. His comfort and my sweet support, I wait for it with patience. I wait for it with patience. What though I wait the live long night until the dawn appears? My heart still 
trusteth in his mind, it doubteth not nor feareth. To the so ye of Israel seen, ye of the Spirit born in thee, and wait till God appeareth. And wait till God appeareth. our sins and sore our woes, His grace much more abound than His helping love no limit knows, our utmost need it soundeth, our shepherd true and true is He, who will at last His Israel free from all their sins and sorrows. Good to be back. We've been out for a couple of weeks, and we certainly have missed our church family. <clears throat> Turn with me to Second Samuel, chapter sixteen. That's on page two sixty six and seven in the pew Bible. Second Samuel, chapter sixteen. And for months we've been following the saga. I guess we could use that word of David. He has, uh, first, of course, we recall months ago, he continually tried to be faithful to Saul the king, but Saul was after him all the time. <laughs> and then uh, finally David became king, and uh, now we're going to see David is dealing with uh, a very rebellious son, Absalom. And we will see in the latter part of this scripture a prophecy that uh, was given uh, a few a few years before by Nathan when uh, David had uh, taken Bathsheba as his wife. Uh, Nathan came to him and uh, confronted him in God's name, and Nathan told him that uh, you're going to uh, suffer because of this. As a matter of fact, you're going to suffer great embarrassment uh, because of this, in addition to other problems. Of course, we know that the child that David and Bathsheba uh, had died. But we're going to see at the end of the scripture today this, this great shame, embarrassment, disrespect, whatever the terms you might want to use for what Absalom did <coughs> in, in front of the people to his father. So let's begin reading, and we'll also pay close attention to David's continued confidence in God. Lots of things have happened, but David is still a man after God. And we're going to see here a perfect example where David could have lashed out at someone. He's the king, and, he, and yet he does not because he believes that even this, uh, these accusations and cursing against him we'll see are from God for some purpose. So let's read together, 2 Samuel chapter 16. When David had passed a little beyond the summit, Ziba, the servant of Mephibosheth, met him with a couple of donkeys saddled, bearing 200 loaves of bread, 100 bunches of raisins, 100 of summer fruits, and a skin of wine. And the king said to Ziba, Why have you brought these? Ziba answered, The donkeys are for the king's household to ride on the bread and summer fruit for the young men to eat, and the wine for those who faint in the wilderness to drink. And the king said, And where is your master's son? Ziba said to the king, Behold, he remains in Jerusalem. For he said, Today the house of Israel will give me back the kingdom of my father. Then the king said to Ziba, Behold, all that belongeth to Mephibosheth is now yours. And Ziba said, I pay homage. Let me ever find favor in your sight. 
my lord the king. When King David came to Baharim, there came out a man of the family of the house of Shimea, the house of Saul, whose name was Shimea, the son of Gera. And as he came, he cursed continually. And he threw stones at David and at all the servants of King David. And all the people and all the mighty men were on his right hand and on his left. And Shimea said as he cursed, get out. Get out, you man of blood, you worthless man. The Lord has avenged on you all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose place you have reigned. And the Lord has given the kingdom into the hand of your son Absalom. See, your evil is on you, and for you are a man of blood. Then Abishai, the son of Zeruah, said to the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over and take off his head. But the king said, What have I to do with you, you sons of Zeruah? If he is cursing because the Lord has said to him, Curse David, who then shall say, Why have you done so? And David said to Abishai and to all his servants, Behold, my own son seeks my life. How much more now may this Benjaminite leave, this Benjaminite, leave him alone and let him curse, for the Lord has told him to. It may be that the Lord will look on the wrong done to me and that the Lord will repay me with good for the cursing today. So David and his men went on the road while Shimea went along on the hillside opposite him and cursed as he went and threw stones at him and flung dust. And the king and all the people who were with him arrived weary at the Jordan and there he refreshed himself. Now Absalom and all the people, the men of Israel, came to Jerusalem, and Ahithophel with him. And when Hushai the archite, David's friend, came to Absalom, Hushai said to Absalom, Long live the king, long live the king. And Absalom said to Hushai, Is this your loyalty to your friend? Why did you not go with your friend? And Hushai said to Absalom, No. For whom the Lord and this people and all the men of Israel have chosen, his I will be, and with him I will remain. And again, whom shall I serve? Should it not be his son? As I have served your father, so will I serve you. Then Absalom said to Ahithophel, Give your counsel. What shall we do? Ahithophel said to Absalom, Go into your father's concubines, whom he has left to keep the house. And all Israel will hear that you have made yourself a stench to your father, and the hands of all who are with you will be strengthened. So they pitched a tent for Absalom on the roof, and Absalom went in to his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. Now in those days the counsel that Ahithophel gave was as if one consulted the word of God. So was all of the counsel of Ahithophel esteemed, both by David and by Absalom. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you for your word and for uh, what you teach us through your word. And Father, we are reminded this morning that you forgive sins, but that our sins follow us and that there are uh, ramifications and complications that sin produces in our lives in the lives of our family. So we pray, uh, first off this morning, that you would indeed uh, be with us, uh, hold us close to you, direct our steps so that we do not go to the left or to the right, but that we walk the straight path of righteousness. Father, we know that we will sin, and we thank you for your forgiveness. We pray that uh, you will continue to uh, use your Holy Spirit in our lives to direct uh, our steps uh, correctly. Father, we thank you for the testimony of David that through all of this, David uh, was depending on you and he realized that you were in, in control. Help us to remember that you are sovereign and that uh, the world seems out of control often, but yet we know that it's not, that it is following whatever paths you've established. Father, we're not smart enough. Uh, we're not spiritual enough to understand all that you are doing, oftentimes even in our own lives. We don't know what you're doing, but we have faith in you. 
We have confidence that we can depend on you in all circumstances and in all situations. Father, we thank you for this church body that uh, we have to uh, raise, uh, raise each one of us up and to comfort us and to encourage us. I pray that we'll be active in doing that with one another as we see needs that we'll reach out and meet those. But Father, I pray that we'll swallow our pride when we have needs and share that with others uh, so that they may comfort and encourage us uh, and likewise we might do that to them. Father, we pray for those who are out this morning either due to illness or to traveling. We pray that you would minister uh, to them by your Holy Spirit bring healing to them, uh, bring safety to their travel, and bring them back to us uh, soon. Father, we thank you for uh, those uh, associated or affiliated with our church and their families who are uh, serving in the military. We pray that you would minister your grace and your mercy and your encouragement to them and to their families this morning. Father, we uh, thank you for those serving uh, on the mission field. We especially Continue to pray for Caleb Petrie and for your uh, help with uh, his decisions about where he might serve you in the future. Father, we uh, thank you for the blessings that we've received by many of us going out and serving you in mission work this summer. We thank you for watching over us and keeping us safe. Father, we uh, thank you this morning for the blessings, material blessings that you've given each of us. And Father, as we receive this offering, we ask that you would use uh, these uh, offerings and ties to further your kingdom. Give us wisdom as uh, church officers, how best to use these gifts to bring glory to you and to further your gospel message and to bring many additional people uh, to the foot of the cross that they may worship you and praise you. Father, we do uh, lift up Pastor Paul this morning as he uh, comes to preach your word to us, I pray that you'd give him boldness and that you'd give him courage, that you would speak uh, through him by your Holy Spirit. And Father, we thank you and praise you that you are a loving God who we can depend on completely. And we thank you for this love demonstrated through your son Jesus. In his powerful name I pray.
turn with me please in your Bibles to 1 Peter. And if you're using one of the Pew Bibles, that's found on page 1014. I'm going to preach a message through the entire book of Peter today. And I can't remember if I told you last Sunday morning, but was sharing last Sunday evening that as we're coming to the, we came to the end of the Gospel of John as Peter was... Uh, gathered there with Jesus around that charcoal fire and then walking along the beach with him, being restored to his ministry. What, what happened to Peter after that? Where is he now? And that's why I wanted us to, to go to the first Peter and think through this book. And we sang together uh, this hymn, turning, I think, I hope, the, the wheels of our memory back to the question that Jesus asked Peter. Peter, do you love me? It's Peter's confession. And that... Um, is going to be kind of the focus of what we're thinking about today is, is where our love is for Christ and how that falls and how it's reflected in the ways that we're responding to life and the things that are going on around us today. And I'll give you some more thoughts about that and some introductory remarks in a minute. But first, let's read through several sections of First Peter. Again, if you're looking in the, the Pew Bible, that's on page 1014. And I'll begin reading in chapter 1, verse 3. <clears throat> Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. Though you do not now see Him, you believe in Him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. And go to chapter 2, verse 18. Chapter 2, verse 18. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing, when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure. But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. And let's go to chapter 4, verse 1. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. The time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. And then down to verse 12 of chapter 4. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when His glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. And in chapter 5, verse 6. 
Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on Him, because He cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. After you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. I want people to like me. I want to fit in. I, I don't want to suffer scorn from those around me. I don't want to be uncomfortable. I don't want to be rejected. I, I want to enjoy my relationships with people and family and, and so forth. I want those to go smoothly. I, and, and I'm going to go out on the limb and say that I bet you're very much the same way. People who line up for abuse and criticism and, and conflict um, are a little bit unusual, I think. And yet, the theme, if you picked up on it in this little book, is that Christians are going to suffer. There's a, there's a theme of, of suffering and difficulty and trial woven throughout the entire book. And then, even though I didn't read from every chapter, it's, it's there in every chapter. Now, we finished our study of gospel and, I mean, of the gospel of John, and in looking at the life of Peter at the end of that, I think we see some of these same things. He wanted to avoid the discomfort of confessing Christ in the garden that night. And, and it wasn't like somebody was holding a hatchet to his head or something like that. It was a little servant girl who said, you're with him, aren't you? And, and some guys gathered around the fire. I think your accent betrays you as, as one of those guys who follow Christ. Aren't you one of those? And, and three times he violently denies following after Jesus. But not after that. We see Peter standing before rulers, government officials, and, and different groups of people refusing to deny Christ but following him, preaching to groups of people, saying, well, we don't know what's right about what you command, but we know what's right about following God, and that's what we're going to do, even if it's against what men call us to do. You see those kind of things all through Acts. He's thrown into prison, and then tradition tells us that he's eventually crucified because of his relationship to Jesus. But before that, he writes to these young believers. And so, as I mentioned earlier, we want to see how God has matured Peter and what advice he gives to them because I think their situation is very much like ours. Now, one might expect to find boastful, brash, arrogant Peter writing a letter toward the end of his life about all the things that his faithful service to God had accomplished. You know, and, and recounting all the things that had been done in, in being the foundation of the church in many ways across Asia Minor. And yet, what we find here is a very quiet, Christ-focused maturity that calls Christians to understand the basis of their faith and the consequences of that faith and how to respond in those consequences. He's writing to a, a group of people who are living up under the difficulty of following Christ in various kinds of ways, not even so difficult as what Peter faced, not oppression and, and persecution from a government. They weren't being lined up and killed necessarily where Peter's writing. They're people who are facing just the kind of everyday junk that comes from folks at work that they used to drink and party with, but they no longer drink and party with them, and they're going, what's up with you? You used to do this, and, and now you don't. And, and they're, they're suffering the, the kind of the, sh the shunning from family members. They don't get invited to the reunion anymore because they don't line up with them anymore in the way that they're living their lives and treating their wives and raising their children and spending their money and doing all the kind of normal day-to-day -day stuff that people all do. But being marked out by following Christ, they're, they're, they're being persecuted. And, and they're suffering as a result of that. Peter 
says you're being maligned for these things because you're no longer living in the same way that you did before. And these young Christians can have the tendency, like I imagine sometimes we might, of saying, wait a minute, I'm living for Christ. I'm doing the right thing. And, and this is what I get as a result. This is how I'm going to be treated because of my faith in Christ. Why is this happening to me? And how am I supposed to live this way? Now, I think in case I forget to ask this question later on, a pressing question in our lives as followers of Christ needs to be, if because of the way I love my spouse and raise my children and spend my money and conduct myself in social gatherings and do my business and my work and so forth, am I being treated badly? Am I suffering the consequences? Am I being maligned for doing right? Not, am I an obnoxious Christian who goes out and offends people by my behavior, but because of doing good, am I being maligned? And if not, why not? That may be the the $64 question that we need to wrestle with today or the the $8 million or eternally valuable question. If I'm not being maligned for following Christ, why not? But if I am, why and what do I do with it? And I want to give credit to Mark Dever, who I think is, is our day's master at taking huge chunks of Scripture and distilling them down into useful things. And he asks those two questions out of this, this book. And so uh, I, I want to give him credit for helping me think because I just got stuck in the, the introduction. And I had to keep reminding myself, you're not preaching a message through Peter now. You're just preaching the message of Peter in one week. And so he helped me a great deal, and I'm thankful for his good help in that. So let's ask the question, first of all, why were they suffering? Why do we suffer? There are, I think, roughly two reasons for the kind of suffering that we endure, and Peter lines them out for us. First of all, in chapter 4, verse 15, he says that there's suffering for doing evil. Um, And he reminds us there that there's no real good in suffering because you've been a murderer or a thief or a meddler. Uh, Let none of you suffer, he says, as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. That's uh, the result, that that kind of suffering is an expected and right result of that kind of junk. And Christians ought not be suffering that way because we ought to be doing those kinds of things. So we're not talking necessarily about, about the kind of suffering that comes rightly as a result of breaking the law or those kinds of things. Those kinds of behaviors shouldn't be named among us, so we shouldn't be knowing that kind of suffering. Which also reminds me that you shouldn't, when you're suffering, say, if, I think it's going to be pretty clear if that's the result or if that's the cause of your suffering. You shouldn't be saying, why is God mad at me if you're suffering and you can't tell that it's because you broke the law or did something that deserved it? Am I, does that make sense? I can't stay there very long. But don't accuse God of, of playing games with you. Don't accuse Him of being spiteful and vengeful or unjust or, or playing hide-and-seek with goodness. That's not the way that God deals with His people. And so when something bad happens to you and you're tempted to go, wow, somebody up there must not like me, that, that's not godly thinking at all. And so don't, don't go there. The second reason that Peter talks about us suffering is suffering for doing good. And that's the kind of suffering that had come on these people. And, and it seems such a strange thing that anyone would suffer or be persecuted for doing good. It doesn't make sense. And yet we've probably all had that kind of experience in our lives and we want to understand why it happens. And I think there are at least three reasons that it happens. The first reason that people suffer for doing good is because of who God is. Back in chapter 1 in verses 14 through 16, there's a clarification. And I want to point you to the end of verse 16. God says, you shall be holy because I am holy. And the short answer here as... God is laid out here as the creator that Christ the King has been revealed to us and that we're to be obedient to Him. Peter's telling us that God the creator is the King and He is holy. And so He's called us to be holy. And yet the world is in rebellion against Him and so the world is in constant conflict against God. 
because of who he is in his very essence as the holy creator king who demands that his creation respond to him in a particular way, but they don't because they're not like him. Secondly, the reason that this occurs is because of who we are called to be. Now, move on over to chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. <clears throat> but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. In the salutation of this letter, Peter calls us the elect of God. Here he calls us a chosen race and a royal people, a people that God has chosen out for himself and called to live in reverent fear of Him. So we are to reflect the holiness of God, and that's what our lives are to be. The, the Apostle Paul would say it this way, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And that's to be the thing that marks us out. Now remember that Paul is writing, if you can see back in chapter 1, uh, that he's writing to people who are dispersed out across Asia Minor, uh, to people in Pontus and Galatia and Cappadocia and Asia and Bithynia. And those are, are peoples who are predominantly Gentile, but there are also Jews who have been dispersed or scattered out into that part of the world because of their faith. They are a people of multiple languages and backgrounds and prior religions. They are people of different traditions. And uh, all those kinds of things are separating them. And yet now they've been bound together in a, a group of people who are unified by their connection to Christ and by lives that are being turned towards the holiness of God, where their lives were marked by uh, marching to, to a worldly drummer, if you will, or a worldly drumbeat. Now they're taking their cues from the holiness of God. And so their lives are being transformed. And that means that the world around them is going to think them strange. Now, this is not the kind of strangeness that, you know, uh, David Good and Brandon Ideson go back and forth about in terms of preference over cotton candy ice cream. You know, I can't remember which one of them likes it and which one doesn't. But one looks at the other and he says, I think your preferences are strange. That's not the kind of strangeness that Peter's talking about. This is not the strangeness at the superficial level of preferences and choices and colors and Mac and PC and those kinds of things. This is strangeness at the level of who and what we are. It's strangeness in terms of life transformation and that you, as I mentioned earlier, have now taken on a different way of living. You're functioning in the very essence of, of who you are as a person in a different way than I've ever seen or known and there's nothing in the world that will make people more uncomfortable than that you get around somebody who's living in a fundamentally different way than you are there's discomfort there there's a, there's a rub and a conflict that goes on in that and that's what um, Peter's describing going on here in this particular situation now I want to challenge you to think about this as a, a, a meditation exercise this afternoon. It goes back to the earlier question. In what ways is, is your life marked by taking its clues from the holiness of God so that it becomes fundamentally different from the people that are not Christians around whom you work and live? In what ways is your life marked as being fundamentally different? Not just in terms of preferences, but in terms of fundamental things. And if those are not there, then that's a call for us to examine our hearts. In fact, I think it leads us to ask this question. How can we tell really what's going on in our hearts? How can I tell what the, the trajectory is? the proclivity of my heart is. Well, let's follow the example of Peter for a moment. When 
persecution came, and it was time for him to declare his loyalty. You know, when the heat of the moment came, that's what pressed him and exposed him for who he was. It exposed his heart for where it was really focused. And so the, the press of persecution will expose us. When it was time to declare his loyalty, Peter denied Jesus. And so that's why when Jesus got him around the charcoal fire, he said, Simon, do you love me? And that's what this, test, this text is asking us. Do we love Christ? Is our, is our heart pointed towards him? That's the example that he set for us in chapter 2, verse 21. And the way we suffer is a reflection of what's going on in us. When circumstances begin to force us to choose, what we really love will come to the surface. Our love indicates our God. Points out what we obey most, what we delight in most, what we trust most, what we hope in most. To, to be clear, um, you know, when we lose something, the way we respond to that reflects how our heart's really directed. You know, when, when something comes and sucks money out of our bank account, when uh, some important relationship to us gets taken away, when we don't get the, the promotion that we wanted, when that sale doesn't go through, when we don't get that grade, when this ambition is not fulfilled, and that reaction to that displays how our love is directed. And in chapter 2, verse 21, Peter says, For this, to this, you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his footsteps. And so when the press comes, how we respond to that is, is lined out for us, and the example for us, I guess, is, is in Christ, who suffered rejection by the world. Now think about Peter as he's writing this, and he remembers saying, Lord, I'll never deny you. All these other flunkies may fall away, but not me. I'll never deny you. And then he does. And then he saw Jesus suffer for him. So he refused to suffer for Christ, and then he saw Jesus pay the penalty for his sin. And it's, it's through that lens that he's writing and saying, to this you are called. And later in the, the chapter he says, don't be surprised, don't be caught off guard when you suffer for doing right. He remembers the words of Jesus, that they were to be ready to take up their cross and follow after him. And he's writing that not in a day when crosses were dainty little jewels that hung from gold necklaces around the neck, but when it was a, a, an instrument of persecution and death. You know, it would be like wearing an electric chair or or a syringe full of deadly chemicals around your neck. How strange would that be? And so he's writing it in a day when, when they understood what the cross meant. Oh, and, and while we're at it, to quote Mark Dever, Jesus didn't say this, that is, take up your cross and follow me, to establish a class of the religious elite. He was saying it because that was where he was going, and he called everyone who followed him to go with him to go to the, to the cross daily and to deny ourselves so that when it comes to loving Kathy well, I'm going to have to die to myself. When it comes to pastoring you well, I'm going to have to deny myself and die. When it comes to loving my children well, I'm going to have to die. It's not some incredible super elite Christian status of, of necessarily a guy who's traveled around the world 12 times on his knees with a cross strapped to his back. It's a guy who loves his wife well. It's a woman who loves her husband well. It's parents who nurture their children. It's children who honor their parents. It's employees who do their, their jobs faithfully. It's the daily grind lived out to the glory and the honor of Christ. And then some of those other huge things happen, but they happen because of the foundation of following Christ and dying to self. Well, thirdly, and just really quickly, this suffering comes to us, it's brought to us because faithful endurance finds, the favor, finds favor with God. Because faithful endurance finds favor with God. 
Look in chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. For this is a gracious thing, when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin, you are beaten for it, and you are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. I'm not going to spend a bunch of time here, but see the contrast. It's not really any credit to you if you deserve to be beaten and you endure it well. But it's a gracious thing to you, or God smiles on one who suffers for doing good and endures it patiently and well. And so for those times when we are suffering for doing good and endure it to the glory of God, know that that brings the smile of God. It's an outworking of the covenant faithfulness of God in extending grace to you. All right, now let's move on and say, what should our response be? And I know that we're going to have to do these really quickly. What should our response be to this suffering? First of all, remember whose you are called to be. I mentioned early, you know, remember who you are, but now remember whose you are called to be. And I want to ask you to go back to chapter 1 and look at verses 1 through 3 with me for just a moment. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles. Now, I'm, I know that we're not living in Asia Minor, but I think that we're the same kind of exiles, the elect exiles or strangers in Auburn that these guys were. And so this applies to us. And I, I want to ask you, what do you think of when you hear the word elect? Does it conjure up a strange feeling in the pit of your stomach because you don't like to have that argument about election? Does it uh, make your brain hurt because you start trying to sort out divine, res- or divine sovereignty and human responsibility? You know, what comes to mind? Well, let me ask you to look on down into verse 2 and see what's going on here. Peter calls them elect exiles according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with His blood. And he writes a huge theological statement there. People don't write salutations like this anymore, do they? You know, we say, Dear George. Peter, in this salutation, lays out books worth of theology. And you might think it's strange that as one writing to a group of people who are suffering, he didn't start by saying, Dear exiles, God is the God of all comfort. And he cares about you and he knows your situation because he's omniscient and you haven't been forgotten. And you would think Peter would start that way, but he doesn't. He calls them elect exiles. And then he describes the work of God in salvation from eternity past as he ordains the salvation of his people as God the Father is going to choose to have sons and daughters. And then he says he's working it out by applying it to them through the Holy Spirit. And he's securing their obedience to Jesus Christ. And this Trinitarian picture that he paints here is to let us see that God is the one who is purposing and working out and securing our salvation. And so the thing in which we're struggling, wait, I'm I'm a Christian, I'm a follower of Christ, and, and I'm not sure this is all working out like God planned. Because he starts the letter by saying, God has a sovereign plan and he's at work working that out in your life as the elect child of God. And so he's establishing for us the greatness of God and the provision of God and the work of God in saving us. I want to take time to um, recount a little experience I had on Friday morning. You know, I, I try to play basketball with some guys at Frank Brown, and it's a, it'd be a unique sociological study for anybody who's majoring in sociology to watch how a game gets started. You know, they, they shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot, and, and somebody finally, somehow we get going. And this week, somebody said, two people shoot for captains. And there were 13 guys in the gym, and a guy named Tim shot and hit, and I shot and hit. And suddenly I'm a captain, and I don't like being a captain because sometimes people don't want to play on the team with the, the old fat preacher 
You know, just to be honest with you, I'm the weak link on any team. And, uh, and so I said to another guy, I said, hey, you know the guys in here better. Why don't you pick? And also I said that because Tim, the guy that, that I was shooting with, who was the other captain, said, oh, Rev, when I hit, I told you they call me Rev, the Rev. Rev, I want, I want you to be on my team. And so I thought, well, okay, no big deal. I'll let somebody else pick, and I'll play with Tim because I like playing with him. He didn't pick me. <laughs> so I went from being the captain to the guy who was going to get to play with Tim to the guy sitting on the bleachers watching everybody else play. Elect of God, not Tim, not just a guy across the room. God who spoke and brought the universe into existence, who rules and reigns over the entire universe and creation, the God who raised Jesus from the dead and holds all things in their existence, the God who of all these things and the greatness and the majesty and the glory that's expressed in all that He is and all that He did, chose you. And so, discouraged, struggling brother or sister, as you're trying to fall after, fall, fall after Christ and, and you find yourself being inconsistent and faltering along the way and stumbling and struggling, know that this is the God who has redeemed you and He will secure these things because His steadfast love endures forever and His faithfulness for all eternity. This is the God who saved you. And so in your suffering, this is the God to whom you belong. This is what I want you to hear from now on when you hear the term election or the, the term that you are elect, this is what I want you to think of. Not the theological struggles and not the sorting things out, not the fights you've had with people. This is what I want you to hear. Loved before the foundation of the world. Loved before the foundation of the world by the God of all creation. That's what I want you to hear when you hear the term election. Second, so remember whose you are. Second, respond in love and serve the very ones who persecute you. In chapter 2, verse 18, um, Peter says, Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. In chapter 3, he says, Wives, be subject to your own husbands, even if they're unbelievers, that they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. So, here he's, he's calling us to be gentle and kind towards those who persecute us. Now, I want to qualify that. I'm not saying that anyone should stay in an abusive situation. I'm not saying that anyone should tolerate those kinds of things. But I'm saying that in the general principle, we're to respond in love and serve the very ones who persecute us. In chapter 3, verse 20, he uses Noah as an example in the days of Noah, while the ark's being prepared, uh, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Remember that Noah, for a hundred years or so, was building an, a massive boat and talking about a coming flood in a place where it had never even rained. Can you think how strange people thought him? And there were just a few, just a few. They were few in number. It, they weren't the majority opinion. And, and they just kept following after God. They kept obeying God. As I'm sure people set up lawn chairs around them and heckled them. Yeah, y'all want to go down and watch Noah and his family build a boat? Want to go down and listen to Noah talking craziness about coming judgment? I'll meet you there after work. You bring the beer. You know, that's, that's what was going on around Noah, his family. And yet they were eventually vindicated as he, kept, he proclaimed the word to them and he obeyed God. Thirdly, be holy. I already read in chapter 1, verses 15 to 16, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. 
This is to be our relationship to God, reflecting His character in all that we do. I'm going to move on. You understand what that means. It, Peter, in verse 8, I just quickly, okay, I think Peter's kind of amazed at these Christians when he says, though you haven't seen him, you love him. Remember, Peter was the guy who was with Jesus all the time, and Peter's the one who had to reorient his heart to really love Jesus. And he says, man, you guys haven't even seen him, and you love him. And that's what he's calling us to, is to direct our love towards Christ. That's what holiness is about. Holiness pours out of a love for God who is holy. Okay? And so this world is making an endless journey into itself. We are making a journey, not into ourselves, but into holiness and into the arms of our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. That's our relationship to God. Fourthly, be witnesses. This is our relationship to non-Christians around us. Chapter 2, verse 11. Behold, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So remember how God dealt with us when we were opposed to Him and deal with the people who are opposed to God in the same way. Don't withdraw from unbelievers. Don't isolate yourself from the world in the sense that you withdraw from them and never have any influence amongst them. And then finally, fifth, be loving toward each other. Chapter 4, verse 7. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly since Love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling, and so forth. You know, when, when a press comes in your life, your tendency is going to be to be short and angry and, and frustrated with these people right here. Well, I'm, I don't like the way they do things over there. I'm going to find a new church and, and suddenly things that never mattered will start to be a big deal to you and what Peter is reminding us is that in our relationships with each other as the press of the reality of following Christ comes these are the people we need to love most and best and we do it with the strength that God provides and we commit ourselves to a faithful creator so that we continue to do good. We take mind of what God says and we listen to Him. And then as Peter encourages us at the very end of the book, we stand fast and we stay the course. Brothers and sisters, because we have such a great living hope that's described in chapter 1, we stand fast and we live steadfastly even in the face of difficulties and suffering. We keep it loving each other well keep sharing the gospel with lost people. We keep pressing after the looking like Christ. We keep believing that he provides for us a blessing even in the sufferings that we're enduring. And if you're not a, a Christian here today, not a follower of Christ, and you've heard all these things and they sound strange in your ears, I understand that. It's not supposed to make sense to you apart from a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so I would say to our children who are not followers of Christ, not believers or or maybe you came and, and are visiting with a friend or you're just interested in what Christianity is about, I'm praying that God would help you to see that, that He is the only hope that you have for real satisfaction. I want to close by asking you this. You know, as we're thinking about what, what we're after, can you tell me one thing in this world that's not rusting away? Can you, get, can you think of one thing in this world? Now, now engineers, don't get smarty and, and legal with me, okay? Seriously. Some of you tend to do that. Like, well, I can find the one exception. No, don't do that. Can you tell me one thing in this world that's not rusting away and decaying? Can you tell me one thing in this world that's not corrupted by sin? 
Can you tell me one thing that this world has to offer you that doesn't diminish in the satisfaction it provides and you have to have more of it? Or you have to have that thing in a more intense form? One thing. I don't think you can. Jesus Christ alone is the uncorrupted, undiminishing, unfading satisfaction to your soul. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your goodness to us, even in our suffering. We thank you that as we endure it well and as we respond to it in the way that you responded, the example that you set for us, when you were defiled, you did not defile in return. When you were mocked and, and insulted, you did not respond in anger or vengeance or in, in any of those kinds of ways. You are the example for us. And as we follow your example, we find favor with God. We find the smile of God in that, in the provision of God. We thank you that suffering is not meaningless and that even in the midst of that, our faith is being purified so that it brings to you glory and honor. And Lord, I can't say that I'm one who has suffered a whole, whole lot. And so I'm pressed to think about my life. And I pray that you will help us to examine our own hearts today about things that are fundamentally different in us because we belong to you. And may we more and more and more reflect the strangeness of belonging to Jesus Christ to the praise and glory and honor of God. We ask it in Jesus' name. Would you stand together with me? We want to sing a song that, that has just been new to us recently. And it is, I think, a, a prayer of commitment to us. It speaks of the journey that we're on and the fact that it can be difficult sometimes, but that it is one that will produce in us the likeness of Jesus Christ. And so I pray that we would uh, desire that. Jesus, draw me ever nearer as I labor through the storm. You have called me to this passage, and I'll follow, though I'm worn. May this journey. guide me through the tempest as my spirit stayed and sure when the midnight meets the morning let me love you even more may this journey
this word of encouragement from God's word. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, honor, glory, and power forevermore. Amen. God bless you as you go this day. We'll gather again at 1115 to continue our time of Bible study. And in the meantime, encourage one another in Christ. God bless you.